All right. So, um, well, uh, here you can see probably that uh, a large group has gathered, and uh, this is for Kalpa's uh, proposal defense. Uh, we want to, um, you know, get a stock of uh, what he has accomplished, whether he has a cohesive viewpoint or what we call his thesis statement, uh, and uh, get a handle on what he proposes that he will accomplish before uh, he will get to the stage of dissertation defense. So, um, take on Kalpa. Um, hello, everybody, and um, my committee members, and then the um, uh, friends here. So, uh, I'll, I'm going to talk about today um, semantics based summarization, utilization, and alignment. That is the knowledge available on the web. I'm going to talk about on these three topics. And uh, my committee members are joined, some of three of them uh, online. Um, Have you, can you ask if they can hear you? Right? Yeah, I checked before. Um, can everybody hear, right? Yes. Um, Gong yes, and sir. hi Gong, you you also right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then Gong Cheng joining from China and Nanjing University and Edward Curry from Ireland and URG and Hamid from IBM Research here USA and then three committee members Dr. Shet, Dr. Prasad and K K Chen. Um, so let me start. So as we see in the recent past communities and people started publishing data on the web. And in the recent past, it has been in the hype that linked open data and then the publishing rules that Tim Berners-Lee introduced made effect in making data available on the web. So we have data and knowledge available. And then in this talk, we are, I'm going to talk about how we can effectively present this knowledge to users when browsing and searching. And then can we utilize the knowledge in improving some of the techniques that we already know? And again, at the end, I'm going to talk about how can we integrate this data on the web? Because it can be silos, and then even though they are connected, they can be redundant. So I'm going to talk about these three topics. I'll start from my thesis statement. So semi-structured data, that means RDF triples are structured. We can say it is structured. But I'm processing some semi-structured components in the, in the structured data as well. That's why I want to say semi-structured data. Published as semantic web can be summarized for querying for ease of use and clustered through semantic similarity. That is to utilize them in some way to improve some of the techniques and integrated to alignment uh, for better quality and ease of human consumption. So these three topics I'm going to touch now. Okay, I think this doesn't read well this as the semantic web. It should be probably using semantic web standards or something like that. Uh, what is published as semantic web? It's not semantic web as a whole, right? It's just a very small component of that. We want to make the topic like not the web, but the semantic web standard. Okay, I think you probably will see that. Okay. Or RDF. Mm -hmm. And then the three topics. Uh, under the summarization, I'm going to talk about entity summarization, and then mainly focusing on conciseness and then comprehension or comprehensiveness. And it's already there. Summary should be concise, but what can I add? I'm adding the comprehensiveness. And then also extending the knowledge graphs on the web, like um, enhancing them. So there I'll be talking about typing literals. And uh, utilization of the knowledge, I'm going to talk about how I'm, I'm using the knowledge to improve document retrieval. And on the alignment, so knowledge is available on different knowledge graphs and data sets. I'm focusing on the relationships and how can I integrate them together. So this is the set of topics I'm going to talk about. So let me start with the summarization. So what is an entity in my problem or in this domain? So entity is a real world thing uh, that resides on the data level in the RDF standards or the semantic web knowledge um, uh, representation. So for example, a person, a book, it's, I'm not talking about the schema level. And then I'm talking about knowledge graphs and data sets. So knowledge graph for me is like 
having more semantics in them. So they have rules and facts beyond just the data. So when I say a knowledge graph, it is also a data set, but it has more than just the data. <coughs> so it has semantics. So why entity summarization important? So is it in real happening with uh, in the real world, or is it important? So I could see, or we could see, I started searching for Marie Curie on the web. So when I started searching it, the Google gave me a list of related documents, and also it showed me a summary. So this summary comes from their uh, knowledge graph called Google Knowledge Graph. So they built their own knowledge graph, and then in their report, they identified uh, some creating summaries or summarizing from their knowledge graph as the second priority. In their development process, it is listed as the second priority. They have three priorities. So we could see it is happening and it's important. And uh, the data sets and knowledge graph on the web that I could use freely and available on the web, for example, DBpedia, it is growing in size and number of data sets are also increasing. Uh, for example, DBpedia 2.0, uh, some time back had 1.95 million things, and in recent DBpedia 2015, it has 5.9 million, uh, million things explained. So it's continuously growing. So um, uh, you gave the example of the Google thing uh, about showing that info box. Are you aware of other uh, um, um, efforts, uh, other uh, technologies that uh, also uh, summarize uh, objects uh, related to uh, query or um, documents uh, using additional background knowledge, just like Google is supposed to be using knowledge graph. Similar to uh, Google, like Bing and then... Even more uh, comprehensive than Google. Um. I, I cannot say like it uh, users can search uh, like Google and then get, retrieve the data, but there like may be. Google can search, uh, li like search, yes. Um, I Did you ever take my class and I talked about semantic enhancement engine? Yeah. And uh, did you uh, remember 2001 keynote that shows something called this media uh, yeah. reference objects? Yeah, browsing. was that? Hmm. Where you look for Madonna and uh, information about Madonna from multiple sources actually come and aggregate yeah. and put into that. Huh. So um, their appropriate, you know, extensive, you know, comp significant use of additional background knowledge used in summarizing or providing a uh, sort of information uh, that include, include historical and all links to the latest news. All that was being done. Huh. So I think if, if you, you know, yeah, like I, I took one example that everybody can see on the web, so I, I popular think, one. I think there is a, um, yes, but the, the interesting thing about um, this thing is um, to look under the hood and say what kind of knowledge is used, um, what kind of uh, entity objects or information or data is used in summarizing that such as the links to the latest thing on that right. item. In those days, there were no, there's no Twitter, so there was no uh, display of latest tweet uh, on that particular entity, but there were news items on that that were actually shown. There were links to other web pages that specifically talked about, let's say you talk about a team of a sport team, then the specific link, link to a specific, that team's web page on a website was shown. Oh. And, and so understanding that in summarization, there is um, summari summarizing what's in the text that, that you want to summarize, whatever type of text that you are doing it, and what complementary information comes come from your knowledge is, is important. Huh. Right? Also for the uh, just, you know, okay, I'll talk about more offline. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, as we could see from practical applications, so it helps users understand what they search, 
so entities are more prominent nowadays so what can we do to make ease of the searching so we can use uh, summaries so can help users so by definition summaries should be concise so that means it is short but what else can i add so is there anything more that i could do so we focused on comprehensiveness that means cover more uh, not along the same line of things or same meaning things so that's what i called comprehensiveness so that is about diversity so that's one of the main contributions that i introduced in the entity summarization domain so in the background there are state of the art systems so they use ranking and then select the top k uh, number of facts for the summary and i propose we propose faces that is uh, face red entity summaries that focus on comprehensiveness as well as conciseness so summary is concise but then can we do more so are you able to um, adjust the level of con conciseness uh, based on user interest and yeah, we can, uh, like, in this domain, uh, the, there is a um, parameter to say, I want this size of summary. No, personalization we have not done yet. Um, okay. So some of the preliminary, so entities in this problem is, are uh, defined by features. What is a feature? Feature is a property value pair. In RDF triple, the subject is the entity that we are talking about, and then the property and value is the feature here. And then what is the feature set? Feature set is all the features related to the entity. And um, for example, if I get all the features for the entity Marie Curie, this is taken from DBpedia. I'm showing only some of the extracted ones. And then all these are summaries for uh, length three. And you can make many combinations of summaries so the de by definition summary is like pick subset of the features so you can rank them or use any technique but these are examples for a summary so then what is diversity aware entity summarization that is our approach so we call it faces we take it from faceted entity summaries by facet we mean different themes or aspects of an entity and then its description. For example, this could be, this is a user. And we can think of grouping facts, features, along different themes of the entity. So this can be his hobbies or personal things describing him. This could be his official uh, business related things. And this could be like places he has visited or along that line. So we could see rather than blankly ranking and selecting the top k we could do something more pick from these groups so it could represent as many themes as possible in a summary so i can think of two um, distinct ways uh, to come up with the facets or uh, to come up with the properties of interest one is that let's say that um, the entity is a sports person and that, uh, in, in particular, let's say he's a baseball or football, uh, you know, guy, well-known guy, versus, uh, and, and so the kind of the, the kind of um, you know somebody uh, just like we design in ontology design, we pick out what part of the world you want to model. Uh, we understand in the case of baseball, there are certain things of interest. In case of golf, which tournament the guy plays is of interest. Uh, again, if you go back to um, 2001, 2002, and if you, are, if you remember seeing in your class uh, mm. example of, uh, um, uh, you know, so semantic directory, the example of Tiger Woods, and mm. there were very specific Tiger, you know, because we knew Tiger Wood, uh, Woods is a golfer, the specific properties uh, that were picked up for summarization, for uh, exploration, uh, for semantic browsing were dictated by how a golfer was modeled in the ontology. Yeah. So. And the other uh, type of faces could be based on what uh, what is the current information I'm able to gather, what is known about 
you know, Tiger Woods, which are the, you know, analysis of documents uh, and express features in, uh, you know, that related to data Tiger Woods, because you know, you, you, you know, you, you, you know that these documents talk about Tiger Woods and that you know that here in this case, um, the Tiger Woods non-golf issue, for, such as um, his philandering um, is shown up. And so I, I dynamically, you know, uh, based on the recent content, um, I am able to say that there's a new sort of interesting uh, property uh, or, or, or concept that uh, I, you know, is frequently occurring. And hence, I would uh, also show that in, in that context. Do you make that distinction? So for now, it is we are processing static in like knowledge, like in DBpedia, it's, we are not taking into like evolving facts, like what's happening now. But I will explain later, like the algorithm that I use and adapt, it can adapt to the dynamic or streaming context. We can make use of what's happening now and also what's there like static uh, on the, in the knowledge base. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll explain. So in the, the first part, we are c focusing only on object properties. And the next, I'll talk about how, uh, how we are making use of both object and data type properties. No, but, but in response to his thing, right? I mean, if you have statically all the facts right now, then you should be able to separate the facts about the sports. With yeah, the that we do life. now. Yeah, so I mean, you could have answered that. Yeah, that, that we do now. That's what we want to do here. We want to group into similar similar things in one group. And then the, these two groups may have less similar things. There's so, a common person. Uh, yeah. If, if I can ask a quick, quick question. Huh. Um, is there an echo there? Um, do you, you know, what is your specific input? Is your input only uh, given input such as Tiger Wood as an entity in the example that Amit just gave? Or do you take as input a set of uh, basically entities, including Tiger Wood and including uh, basically maybe some documents or some other people, and the output will be uh, the summarized entities or facilitated entities out of those? Yeah, input input is like one entity, and then it will give you the summary of the entity. Yeah, I, I will explain in the process flow or in like few slides later. So, uh, what are the unique challenges here compared to document summarization? Yeah, um, I will talk about later. But uh, to answer that, document summary, one of the major challenges is like for documents. The techniques we cannot directly use because documents, as we know, have a lot of words and phrases and keywords that we can make use of popularity or frequency of how they are appearing. Let's say uh, Barack Obama appears uh, 10 times in the document. And then we could make a connection that Barack Obama is a popular entity in this um, document, so it could be useful. But in knowledge representation, right? It appears only once, or it doesn't have duplicate entries. So we cannot make we cannot make a decision like in documents. This is one example that it is important. So that's why there are challenges compared to document summarization. Okay, so this is an example and then explanation of what we are doing. So only subset of features shown here for. Entity Marie Curie, uh, these are all features in represented uh, for the Marie Curie. So I colored similar or things that I want to group in the same color. For example, death place and birthplace, I want them to be in one group because it talks about a place related to that person. It is a personal thing. It is not about his professional life or anything. But here, uh, Marie Curie's alma mater and work institution are like related to her professional life, or it's it's separated from her private life. So by this, I could group uh, different facts. So that's what I we mean. Like we want to group things that conceptually similar or intentionally similar. So here, if I want to pick 
a concise and also a comprehensive summary if I pick F1, F2, and F6. And then from the features, it says spouse, uh, birthplace, and known for radioactivity. So I get like different facts in a summary. So if I only rank, maybe I will be getting three facts from here. So it only says everything about professional life of the entity. That's what we want to do here. So this, um, yeah. So, uh, so when you group them together, uh, do you already know the labels because of which you are grouping them? Or? No, we don't know. Like, that also I'll explain, like it is also a challenge because nobody is going to tell you there are this many groups, so we cannot use supervised clustering. So I'm, going, I'm not going to go over the definition just here if you want to analyze. So what is a facet? Facet is a part or item in the partition. For the partition, we take the mathemat mathematical definition for the partition. So it should be non-empty each facet. It should contain all the features collectively, and then no two facets should have a common feature. So that's the basic definition. And then for the faceted summary, what we are saying is like use any kind of ranking or whatever technique you want, but the faceted summary should focus on selecting facts from different facets based on the length constraint that is given to generate the summary. So that is the definition that we are explaining here. We can come back here if you want to dig in more details. And then, for example, if I, gave, if I want to generate summary of length 2, I may pick F1 and F6. And then if I want to pick summary of 3, I'll pick F1, F2 from this group, and then F6 from this group. So I'm not selecting 2 from here. So I, in the simplest case in our algorithm now, we are iteratively going over the facets and picking facts. Of course, if you uh, decide to um, personalize it and you understand that the user's interest is in uh, one yeah. thing only, then you probably will take all the three from every. Yeah. Three. yeah, based on your situation and your uh, requirement, can modify, let's say, we want to pick more from here because it's the demand that the user wants to see now because he's searching for sports, for example, and we want to show more details about the sports, for example, Tiger Woods case. So one, sorry, can, yeah. uh, one question is that are you focusing only on the um, attributes of, or, of that entity, or do you also expand uh, your scope to the neighboring entities maybe that are of, of, of not attributes of that entity, but they, uh, they may have also information about that specific entity. For example, in case of Tiger Wood, there may be um, books that have been written about him. And uh, they are very popular books that you want to, uh, or in case of Obama, for example, that you want to have those included. But they are not really attributes, of, immediate attributes of that entity. So do you include that in your problem definition, or you just focus really on that entity and immediate attributes around that? Uh, no, in this problem space, like oh, for likewise the existing literature as well, in this problem, we are dealing with features for one entity. So we are not looking at a graph. We can go to the graph level, but not in here. So what, what I was wondering is that, you know, given that we are in the context of semantic web, um, how do we bring um, the notion of abstraction level of abstraction in the conciseness. Um, and maybe you have thought about that as you go along um, your talk, if, if that is addressed, uh, you may want to um, mention. But if, if, uh, if we are considering talking about just one level of one level away from, from that entity, there's a different answer compared to say, you know, we have, even in, in terms of features, we have multiple um, distances that you can go away from that um, from that entity, both up the, up the chain or down the chain, and then the notion of abstraction level also comes comes up, uh, comes into the picture, right? Yeah. So um, here we are presenting a subset of features for the entity, 
and then uh, we are not here yet presenting the themes or we could take the themes from the clustering approach or the groups but uh, not yet so uh, I, let me add another interesting um, twist on the, the level of abstraction if you have to go in terms of creating in text that's probably very hard but uh, abstraction as in sort of um, semantically related uh, uh, entities and, uh, and things of interest uh, could be very interesting. For example, I don't know if you remember again 2002 paper that you should have looked at where uh, you type in the name of a company and uh, the system looks up who is the not, or gives you the recent um, uh, news item or whatever is interested in information on that company itself but it looks up the knowledge base and says who are the competitor of this company. And then uh, offers you, if you are interested, uh, or depend, you know, that uh, news about the competitor of this company. Uh, yeah. Which so it's kind of uh, the knowledge base tells me that uh, there is, you know, relationship between these things, and um, application context tells you that uh, the broker is interested in the news of the competitor also because he's uh, interested in the particular industry segment about, you know, uh, related to this uh, particular uh, stock. And hence, uh, you could uh, provide um, some bits of information about those correlated entities also. Um, the abstraction is uh, essentially the information that you are using from the knowledge base. Yeah, so um, I'll talk about later as well, like the extension of this line of work is also like make use of the interlink data set as well, like not only one data set or knowledge graph. So that will bring in more information like you uh, are talking about. Yeah, let me go fast. Um, so for your answer, uh, for your question, uh, like in phases, one of the challenges is like nobody is going to tell us like there are this many groups or it's not in the knowledge base or in the ontology or schema. So that's um, one challenge here. And we adapt Cobweb because we wanted to use um, uh, unsupervised approach. And by definition, it's, it is conceptual. That means it uses probability in deciding groups that it creates. So, and also one other advantage is like it's incremental. We are not making use, full use of it yet, but it will be useful in the later. That means like um, regular hierarchical clustering al uh, algorithms needs to see all the details or facts when it starts the algorithm. But this one, it doesn't need to see all the details. It can adapt as data comes in, so in the streaming context, for example. So because of the time constraint, I'm not going to going in detail of explaining uh, this function, but just want to mention this is the main function in the clustering or grouping approach. It makes use of two probability functions. That is, uh, it maximizes interclass dissimilarity. That means it won't it won't put more things similar in two different groups, and it wants to put more similar things in one group. So we make. Uh, multiplication and just add this that will be useful in deriving this equation so basic functionality of the category utility function in cobweb is to maximize in uh, intra class similarity that means all similar things should be in one group or same group so and different things in should be in different groups so for, for the uh, benefit of all the future presenters also, there is something called a pen there. And you can use the pen to say you're talking about this equation or that equation. How, how, how would these remote people know which equation you're talking about? Oh, okay. Um, and applying basis theorem, um, you get the equation at the bottom. And how? No, because it's uh, hierarchical, it gives you a dendrogram, you can pr or cut the tree at uh, level you desire and get the groups. Okay. 
And this is how the algorithm operates. It's, it has a root. It tries to insert items starting from the root, and it goes down the hierarchy. So at each level and for each node, it computes the category utility function for four main operators that I will explain later. That is insert, create, merge, and delete. That's what makes the dendrogram or the tree in the hierarchy. So words to note here, like the merge and split operators, are the operators that make this algorithm so interesting and makes it incremental. That means adaptive for dynamic content. So I will give you an idea what are these operators. For example, insert. Let's say this is the starting um, uh, tree. So we want to insert an item called C. It comes, it inserts from the root or the level above. And then it will, in this case, it will insert into the right hand node. And then it will compute the category utility function for the parent node. And then decide the score for this operation. And then the create is just creating a new node and then adding the information to the new node. And then compute the category utility for this node. And basically, merge and split are, can be illustrated like this. Merge is like, for a level, it gets rid of some, uh, two nodes and make it into one. But you can actually see the nodes are down like in the hierarchy. But at a level, it got rid of two nodes. That's why it's called merging. And then in splitting, it just gets the nodes up in the hierarchy. So if you cut the dendrogram at this level, uh, sorry, this level, it has two nodes here where it had only one node earlier. So this makes the algorithm dynamic. I just want to illustrate that aspect. And um, what are the other um, challenges just adapting this algorithm into the summarization use case. We want to make sim uh, identify similar themed features, so that is fine. So Cobweb tries to do that. But Cobweb, that algorithm works better when it has more attribute value pairs. So when it sees more, the probability function will work better. But for a feature, we have only two attribute value pairs. For example, take the feature for Barack Obama called spouse is Michelle Obama. So what are the two property value pairs we have here? One pair is, it says the property is spouse, and the next pair is value is Obama. So that's attribute is value here. Uh, value of the attribute is Michelle Obama. So we only have two features to work with to group this feature along with others. So that's not going to work. So that's for that we try to expand the property in a, in a way that the algorithm creates abstract view of the features. So I will explain um, how we are doing that. So we, get, we expand both the property and value separately. We take, for property expansion, we take the label of the property and pre-process it to remove stop words and then process camel case and tokenize. Then what we do next is like all the tokens that we get, we get hypernames from WordNet lexical database. That means hypernames means the abstract meaning for a given term. For example, if uh, it says actor, WordNet will give you actor, the hypernym is person. So we want to aggregate on a higher level similar things together. So it helps here. And then we aggregate all the hypernames that we retrieved and then tokens into a set called word set. That's what we are going to input into the uh, partition algorithm. Similar proce procedure we apply for the value expansion. We get For value expansion, we get the types of the uh, value. In this case, value is a URI in the knowledge graph. So for example, Barack Obama we get all the types. Types are like he's a person, author, and a politician. Those are the types that defined in the ontology. So we follow the similar procedure, expand them 
make the word set. So why didn't you use the property hierarchy here? I didn't use property hierarchy. You used WordNet, right? Yeah. And the terms are for your properties, right? Uh, no. What like or the class hierarchy? Yeah, <coughs> property. Take the property and its label, and then get the hyperlink. I didn't take the hierarchy because it's um, not much details there. Like it's not rich. It's better to use an expansion. We can use both, but we are using only this approach. And this is an example. So you start with the feature. First one, for example, it says region Illinois. The orange color ones are the original tokens that we get from the property and value. Uh, for the property, you get the region. And when you expand, we get location and domain. Those <coughs> are the hypernames. Uh, I'm not showing all the things here for clarity. And then for the value, Illinois, uh, when you get the types from the ontology, it's a place and a populated place. And then when we extend, we expand, we get point, area, and then locality. There are more, but I haven't listed all of them. And then we combine all and make the word set for the feature. That's what we are doing here. And then we adapted the category utility function to work, work in our case. So you can see here we have only two attributes, so it's not working correctly or to the to the point we expect. Uh, in the in the restriction here, it only works. It has only two attribute value pairs. So we expand and create a word set, and then change the function to use words instead of attribute value pairs. So this is the adapted function that we are using for our partitioning algorithm. So then we created the partitions. How are we going to rank? Because we had to select one from each partition or a facet. So there should be a way. So intuition is that if I take New York, I mean New York City and Beaver Creek as a value, not a feature. Which one that most of the people know? I believe it should be New York. So most of the people know. If you see New York, they will identify it better than a local city. Yeah, this is naive way of like, uh, this is not customized to any particular occasion. Like, it can be customized based on your requirement or application. Because if, if you ask the population of your state, yeah, yeah, that's right. You might find out some people who don't know New York, but you might uh, still might find everyone knows you. Yeah, but I expect, like we expect, at least in here locally, most of the people know Beaver Creek. That's the intuition. And if you get the bo the feature, we want it to be unique. Like let's say workplace Washington DC. Washington DC everybody knows, like most of them know. And resident White House. White House also like most of the people know. But which one to pick? So the idea is like it needs to be unique to an entity. So we should be picking up resident White House. We know it gives me an in intuition. Like when I see resident White House, it is talking about Barack Obama or the current US president or somebody working there. So that is the intuition here. So for the whole feature, popularity alone might not work, but then get the unique feature. So this is the in these are the intuitions in the ranking uh, process. But uh, one more question. So when you have unique features, sometimes they are not very uh, representative as well. There might be. Yeah, yeah, that's why we want to get a balanced approach in the ranking. So I'm explaining. So we get the informativeness of the feature. That means the feature alone should be more unique than popular. But then the value of the feature, that means the in the triple, the object part, we want it to be popular. So we want to have a combination. That's why we multiply uh, both, and then similar to TFIDF, we get the ranking score, like multiplying informativeness and popularity. So then we ranked, 
And also we group facets, uh, got the facets, and then we have a ranking mechanism, how we are creating the summary. So first, given an entity, we extract features, all the features that describes the entity. And then we enrich the feature set because attribute value pairs are not enough. So we create the word set by expanding uh, terms. And then we do conceptual clustering with the adapted Cobweb algorithm. And then inside each facet, we rank features. And then we select going through the facets and create the facet identity summary. This is the first uh, approach that we tried. In the second approach, we improved further this uh, process flow. That is to rank facets and also incorporating data type properties, not only object properties. In this work, we are focusing on, on, on only object pro properties. That means object of the triple is a URI, and it can have most of the time types. That means ontology classes uh, assigned to it. So evaluation metrics, I won't spend too much time here. So, we, so there is no publicly available gold standard, so we manually created, taking random entity sample of 50, and then asked 15 um, human judges to create ideal summaries of length 5 and 10. So when a human judge creates a summary, we call it uh, ideal summary. And then for an entity, there are more than one ideal summary. So agreement is like, what is the agreement between the judges for that entity? in creating the summary. And then how we measure the quality of the summary is evaluate the quality of the computer generated summary against all the ideal summaries created for the entity. So what are the, what are the instructions or parameters to give to the judges to create so-called ideal summary? What is the ideal summary? Um, we didn't give uh, any specific guidelines saying pick diversi diversity or choose diverse uh, summary or pick whatever, you know. We just gave them the description of all the features of the entity and asked each one of them to create a summary that you prefer. Mm -hmm. that is, that's why... Uh, your, 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 assuming because your uh, summary is essentially identifying the properties of assets that uh, this is much more manageable than just pure text. Yeah, the thing is like, uh, summary is concise. In the evaluation, we'll see the results. So people prefer seeing different facts than the same thing again and again. So how did you aggregate the different judges' opinions? That's why we have the agreement measure to see to what level they uh, agree. And then for each computer-generated summary, we have more than one ideal summary. So it, we want to make it fair as possible. So two questions here, um, if I yeah. can object. One is that, uh, as you know, the notion of uh, uniqueness and popularity are at uh, odd, meaning that they uh, usually want to see something um, unique that it's not, it's, it's not popular. So how do you, uh, in, your, in your formulation of different um, summaries, you make sure that uh, unique uh, and a uh, unique set of um, attributes are also represented, and which one of them, if there are a long tail of unique um, attributes. And uh, coming back also to the judge, um, how do they measure uh, are, uh, the notion of popularity that they are using? Is that in agreement with the notion of popularity that you have to, uh, defined here based on the frequency? Because they may use their background knowledge to say, oh, yes, this is actually because because of all of the other things that I know, this is popular, but that may not be represented in the data set that, that you present to them. Yeah, uh, for the first one, uniqueness and then popularity, we try to balance it. So we are following similar approach like information retrieval, TF, IDF. So the fee, like both property and value, better it's unique, but then a value becoming popular helps users to identify what it is talking about. So. In that case, uh, we are not doing anything like uh, more than TF-IDF kind of measure to balance the uniqueness and then the popularity. If one val value is more popular and then less unique, it will have a lesser. For example, um, birthplace California and then 
residents birthplace Honolulu for example for Barack Obama and residents White House so both White House and California are popular but then in the algorithm residents White House is ranked higher because it's unique so for the user it's it's our um, intuition that it's better to pick the unique and popular one together than to just pick the unique one and all, or just pick the popular one. No, I think you need to clarify that the popular refers only to the value part. Yeah, yeah. Oh, OK. Whereas the uniqueness is for the whole thing. And that's where there is a difference. It's not. Yeah, mm, yeah, the, it's, yeah, thanks. It is worth to note that the popularity measure is measuring only the last part of the feature. That means the value. So informativeness is for the whole feature. That means property and value. Property and the name and value. What's that? Property name and value. Yeah, property name and then value. And the second question is, um, I forgot actually. Definition of popularity among judges. Oh yeah, that one. Um, there is there is no proper way of instructing users. So we gave them the Wikipedia page for if they want to refer to and they could use any other information source they wanted to if they don't know the entity so it's based on their personal knowledge and then the community what the community knows about it so we didn't give any specific instruction okay so for the evaluation we picked faces is our approach railing is one um, actually done by Gong um, here. So he done it in 2011. And it was the successful approach um, until we proposed conciseness and comprehensiveness both together. And the Samaram only works with DBpedia and for object properties. In this evaluation, we are also only considering object properties. But in our next extension, we show that we can expand. And Railin M is, I modified the code of Railin just to get the diversity there. Just lexical similarity or syntactic similarity. If two property, the same property name is selected for the uh, summary, we don't take it in the summary, pick a different one. So it's just a modification of Railin M. So you see it improves a bit, but still uh, not yet to the summary or the faces. What is, uh, you know, what is this percentage when you have NA? In yeah, um, I'll explain. So uh, first, we generated two types of summaries in length. K equals 5 means 5 facts for the summary. K equals 10 means 10 facts for the summary. And phases improvement is how much gain that phases approach result got over the other approach. That is the difference divided by the other approach's value. That's the percentage gain. And the time per entity, we could see our approach is efficient because the other two approaches using page rank based ranking. It takes some time. But ours, we don't use graph based or page rank based ranking, which we could use and try to improve. And then second evaluation is user preference. We wanted to check whether users prefer the diversity or just the ranking is enough. So it's a different user sample, 69 different judges participated. We gave them 10 computer generated summaries for, three, for each three system, and then they preferred. Um, is it, is this, uh, these judges here or in talks? I made it online like around the world participated. Um, I make the, yeah. So you could see agreement is shown at the bottom of the table. That means what is the agreement between ideal summaries that users create, uh, judges created, and it's the average. You could see ideal summary is a bit low, but uh, it is consistent with the evaluation that Gong did with Raylin. It's hard to make that higher. Um, because users agree, disagree, and then based on the personalized approaches. So this is the generic preference for all the users. So uh, you were looking for comprehensiveness, right, or diversity. 
I think somebody would have asked this question. And just but uh, how does improvement in person, uh, improvement in average quality, reflect comprehensiveness of uh, of the summaries? And also, how did you apply comprehensiveness? Because I think you missing. Is that was that question clear? No, let me. What about it? How does average quality? Uh, can you go to the previous slide where you explain? Uh, hmm. How does the average quality of summaries reflect comprehensiveness of summaries? So we could only measure that because we have applied comprehensive or diverse, diversified approach. The other approaches approaches were not. They were ranking like without taking into whether they are selecting the similar thing again and again. So in that case, we are measuring whether it's successful or not creating diversified summaries is by comparing the other approaches that don't consider diversity. There is no proper way that I could say I would ask users, we didn't ask users whether you prefer diversified approach or just give me whatever you generate. We didn't ask that question. In the user generated summary, it's, so may, it's may, a. Maybe, let, me, let me just try to clarify. So, the past approaches basically were page rank based. Hmm. And they were erring on the side of repeating very simple triples. If you say, give me five uh, triple summary, then they, all the triples were very similar. Then we said, okay, let's uh, look at what a user would like to see. Hmm. And they preferred a much broader uh, set of triples. And our question was, how do we automate that process? And so he came up with this approach of uh, using this Cobweb, which is an unsupervised uh, uh, technique. And that way of formalizing seems to have captured the diversity uh, in code. And so what he's trying to do is, so in his evaluation metric, he's basically asking people to summarize the way they prefer. And we are not taking the intersection of all the summaries because it might even turn out to be empty. Because not everybody will agree with our every triple. But we want to see the summary that we generate, how well does it match anybody else's uh, uh, intuition. And it is, yeah, overlap. it is possible that you agree with the first three triple for one person and the other three triple for the second person. And we want to get credit for both. But if you take the intersection of those two, it might actually be empty. And, and so those are the things that he is trying to capture through the evaluation method. Okay. And then for the user preference, we didn't label which approach generated which summary. It is blinded. Like the 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 user didn't know, like 84 percent, they didn't know which summary they were ranking. It just they saw three summaries, which one they prefer. So it is they didn't know it's blinded. Uh, Evaluation. Uh, let me let me give us since this is just the proposal I'm giving the suggestion, right? So what probably what I would uh, I would look at is you have different clusters, right? And can you give the number of clusters uh, faces has picked up in its ranking, right? And uh, in the same clusters. What all did Relin and Relin M picked up? Right? Mm. If they would have picked up only one or two clusters uh, at, or information, and faces would have picked up five clusters information, yes, it's diverse because it's picking up different cluster information, right? And then you can you can actually tell that yes, you know, since di diversity actually impacted uh, yeah, the change the, uh, in performance. Yeah. Am I making sense? Yeah, they are. There can be not clear space there as well because let's, for example, Raylin picked two features. Okay. Even though it got ranked higher, it could be from two facets in our approach. It could be. And it, I, I sometimes there, it cannot be. There are two metrics that can be looked at here. One is for the first uh, metric to prove that the results that are coming out of faces are actually more diverse compared to what comes out of the other ones. So uh, you may you know, uh, diversity metrics or unique metrics that you have, uh, it would be interesting to report how, uh, on average, um, how diverse, how more diverse 
the results out of this as well compared to the uh, basic results for the same entity that you will get out of the other two approaches. And then the second question would be, so for each of these cases, I know that you have done the study already, but if there is a way to look at the examples that they have, uh, you know, the, the one that they have higher, uh, rated higher, which one of them they were attributed to the unique as or unique part of the um, of summaries that were, they were picked up to be included in the result in cases, and they were not in, in, in the other system. And that make that unpack the notion of quality here, because the quality is a little bit um, sort of very packed, and it's hard to judge uh, how it, it, uh, quality is measured with respect to the claim contribution of the cases. Yeah, I understand. So I remember at that time it was we had one entity for Usain Bolt, and then all the approaches, or at least our approach, I we could remember it was picking up 50 meter um, race over the 100 meters for some reason, and then users preferred 100 meters because he's more famous for the 100 meters um, results. But it's based on how. Well, we could only use the popularity or uniqueness in the knowledge base or in linked open data whole cloud. There are always limitations, but yeah, I understand we could do that as well. It's 200 meters, 100 meters. Oh, yeah, sorry. So, uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I think maybe you can just try to uh, test the different environments of your faces approach. So, you can basically uh, you can only use partitioning without using ranking, or you can use only ranking without using partitioning, and then you can easily see which component of you of your approach really works. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that is also interesting approach. Whether actually the different way of ranking helps, or actually or both, or facets help, and then yeah. Yes. So I think evaluation two is a more well accepted method. But evaluation one may create a more confusion. Mm. If you present those in a conference paper, whatever, people are questioning about the evaluation one. Uh, for evaluation two, it's better you have a very clear guidance for the the judges. Say, okay, now let's evaluate uh, uh, diversity. And what is diversity? What's the definition of that? And another evaluation may be um, uh, what kind of other kind of quality. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah. yeah, okay. We can add more evaluation data for this. And then for analyzing, analysis purposes, I just drew these graphs. So, the red line shows faces results, and then other lines are summarum and railing. So, the students pair t test performed better for our approach, and we were thinking why. Because most of the time, it is as good as at least summarum and better than railing. So on average, it performs better. That's why it gets higher result. And also, the pair t test performs better. Just an analysis. Well, I don't understand this. For example, the graph, uh, you know, the more times the railing uh, uh, or faces is red, okay? Yeah. So that's why it is not just one for, let's say, five entities. It ranked very high, and all the 45 entities, it was performing bad. It was like performing consistently, like okay or better. Well, this is not good presentation. <laughs> you should not present this. You can just uh, say, okay, the t test is out, what's it? But every year, okay. uh, you mm. know, what, um, what percentage is better than the other one? So p value is what? Then that's it. So, yeah, like the times, you, times you, you, know, you, you beat out the competition or average or something like that. Okay. T test values I have, but I didn't give because it may confuse. It was like 0, 0.00 something. It was if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, it is significant. Ours is like 10 to the power minus 3 level. Five. Yeah. That's good. 
So I don't know that I'll have enough time to go on the other three. At least I will try to give more priority for the second approach, which extends the approach that I just described. That is typing the literals in the features. That's where the semi-structured comes as well structured data in my thesis statement. So in the faces approach, we could only use features that have object URIs. That means in the RDF notion, it's a URI. It could have ontology classes assigned to it. So we can get the ontology classes, and then the modified Cobweb algorithm could cluster features. So we cannot use the approach here to extend to data type properties, which the value is just a string, or we say literal. Why? Because it doesn't have semantics. It doesn't have ontology classes assigned to it. So in this approach, we propose a way of assigning ontology classes to these literals or strings, which is a novel contribution in this area. Yeah, which, I want you to clarify what semantics means, because we, if, if you write a string, of course it has semantics. Yeah, right. so um, I want you to be very careful in, in Yeah, in that sense, literals have semantics, but it says the primitive data types that they represent. For example, if it is a birth date, it will say it's a date. If it is age, it will say it's an integer. It doesn't say anything beyond that. If it is um, birthplace, California, it will say it's a string. It won't tell you it's a place or yeah, so, a popular so place. So what I would like you to clarify is that we don't readily know what the types are, what are the other uh, entities or properties that it is related to. And your goal is to uncover those. Yeah. And, and that's how you are trying to get the rest of it done. Yeah, it is hidden. It is there. But if a human looks at it, yeah, so he, could come up, right. he could come up with the type. But machine, machines don't know yet, because it's not there in the knowledge base. So that's what we are making machines understand what the literals are. And then we also extend the faces approach, so two contributions in this step, which uses now both object and data type properties. And it's a practical application we show, we sh we'll show that it's useful to do typing for literals. And uh, importance of literals, like blindly, if I take DVpedia now, it has 1,600 data type properties versus 1,079 object properties. Most of the, some of the data type properties are garbage or noisy, but still, in the representation perspective, it is still higher. And then, for example, if I take simply the DVpedia property location, it contains only strings it has about 100,000 unique values. Unique, not all the counts. That means California, New York, Dayton, like that. It's not typed other than just saying it's a string. You can just follow simple annotation saying, searching it in a knowledge base and give it a place. But it's not that. So it is important to do typing for literals to enhance mm -hmm. the data sets. At least there are simpler, more simplest cases that we could do. Yeah. So whatever I present is like the best effort I could do. Like it's interesting to know that no work has been done on this domain. That's what excited me to do this. So it is satisfying that we achieved considerable uh, like uh, good quality results. Still it can be improved further and then it will in coming years. For example, for ambiguity if you blindly follow, for example, entry linking or uh, named entry recognition tool, for example, take DBpedia Spotlight or any tool, there are three options to take here, the type of the string. You can take the whole phrase. It might have a type in the knowledge base, say 44th President of the United States is a person. You can take the blue colored phrase, President. Is it the type for this phrase? Or you can take the orange colored 
uh, text fragment? Is it the related type for this phrase? We don't know, and then computer doesn't know. And our goal is to pick one of the, these three options and get the type for the phrase. And for example, how useful it could be, like simply I put here three, three um, triples. The first one is object triple. That means the object is a URI and an entity. It has a type called politician. The third, second and third um, triples are data type, uh, has data type properties. So 44th president of the United States doesn't have more than saying it's a string. And then same as the 40th governor of Massachusetts is just a string. So what our approach could do here is like for the president case, it picks the type is president. And then for the governor's case, it picks the type as the governor. So there is a class in DBpedia called governor. And then uh, for the entity president, the type is president as well. So when we, if we pick, if we can pick those two types, then in the ontology, it has subclass of relationship to the politician. Now we could see, or the machine could see, these three triples could be aggregated based on the concept politician, which wasn't possible earlier. So that's one of the goals that we wanted to achieve here and could be useful in many applications. And for the background, we, there are systems to infer missing types for entities and then make use of entity types and uh, inferring a type for noisy data. But all these things work on entities and URIs, not strings. So our work here fits in the literal space. So we, we infer types for literals, which is part of the data type property. So I quickly go through. This is the yeah, process flow. We skip the details yeah. and we get to the other two things that you have in mind. Okay. Algorithm. I won't go into details. And one more thing that the extending phases approach is that the previously described or identified ranking mechanisms won't work here because literals can be put it put in different ways. But the idea is the same. If you want to search the whole, uh, full phrase of the literal, it may give you a different frequency count because it is distinct. But then the idea is the same. For example, United States president and president of the United States. Literally, they are different, but the idea is the same. So, uh, so the idea is like get the most popular entity in the value and then use that entity frequency in the ranking approach, and then make use of the faces approach and build the face uh, the entity summary. So I'm not going to go into details, the modified ranking um, equations here. We can come back if we have questions. These are modified ranking equations, not the same ones that we used earlier in faces, but the same uh, intuition but different uh, uh, semantics used here. And then we also rank each facet. So earlier case, there was a um, drawback. We don't rank fa facet. We just randomly picking a facet and then creating the entity summary, which is not good. So we rank facets and then order them, and then start picking features from top to bottom from each facet and also in inside a facet, we have ranked features for both object and data type properties. So the process is the same. So number four and five steps are slightly different because ranking mechanisms changed a bit. And then for the evaluation of how many correct types we generated, we introduced these two measures. Mean precision is like how many correct types we generated for each literal and then get the average. Any mean precision means if it generates at least one correct type, we get it as one and then get the average. And this is the result of the 
comparison with the baseline, for the baseline we use DBpedia Spotlight and then the results convey the message that a tailor-made approach for uh, typing literals is better than using uh, existing tool which is not made for this purpose. It is still a good baseline tool is still a very good tool but it's not designed for this work. So we see uh, our approach achieves 80 to 90 percent in uh, mean precision and any mean precision while the baseline regular approaches uh, stay around 50 percent. Coverage means how many literals we could cover typing at least one uh, correct type. We don't make use of properties because we cannot rely on property will have a meaningful name. We could use make use of it. So the literal update, it's actually the type can be inherited Yeah, we can do that, but we are not using it mainly. One reason is we cannot rely on having a meaningful name for the property, which, which is expected, but it's not correct all the time. For example, DBPD has sometimes garbage properties and we cannot make use of any meaning out of them. But we could use that to improve the current results, to see whether the meaning of the property agrees with what we have generated. So a kind of um, evaluation there before making the final call. And then because now we use both data type and object properties, we also wanted to check whether still the entity summarization approach works fine. So it works fine, like it still generates better results. So this is the evaluation result. So for, uh, for this evaluation, we have 80 entities, 20 taken from previous one, and new 60 entities from the recent, most recent DBpedia. Uh, version. And then we use 17 human judges, a uh, new uh, evaluation, because we couldn't use the earlier one. Earlier one only had object properties. Now we have more coverage need, needed to do a, a new uh, base uh, gold standard. So gold standard consists of 900 ideal summaries for the 80 entities. Yeah, since it's um, one hour and 10 minutes, I will briefly go through the ideas of the next two uh, parts and then try to finish in like 10 minutes. So the next one is like I experimented while I was work, um, working with Olive, Dr. Olivier Bodenrider at NLM, um, how to use the extracted knowledge from regular web documents to whether we could improve or introduce a new approach of um, uh, measuring similarity. Can we, can we see something new and exciting? So the idea is we simply wanted to retrieve related documents for a given document. It could be ex uh, extended to retrieving related documents for a given query. So both are the more similar things. So existing approaches work better or works very well now with very complex indexing mechanisms and keyword and term uh, indexing mechanisms. So for example, PubMed is an interface for Medline that uses keywords and many other techniques. So we wanted to see whether the extracted knowledge from the documents can we use it to retrieve related documents. So we could say three things about using a knowledge base. Uh, we could say it is more precise. 
because it uses the whole predicate. In biomedical domain, predicate simply means the triple, subject, predicate, object. And more flexible because we will follow a semantic uh, similarity approach, not lexical similarity only. Semantically aware means because we get the whole predicate, the relationship also there in the predicate, we could say if a document says something about it treats a disease, another document says something about a different drug treats the same disease, it may have a similar or higher ranking because the treats, the context is captured there. And then some background in that domain, um, there are successful indexing mechanisms to retrieving documents. But semantic similarity or the knowledge use the way that we introduce uh, is different. And then in the semantic web domain, ranking triples, some approaches are there. So if I just put the overview of what we wanted to do here. So Medline is their biomedical abstracts uh, repository. And PubMed is an interface to search related documents or search. you can put also search queries. So it gets the Medline citations index and rank, use whatever mechanism they make, and then gives you the related documents. What we want to do, or what we did here is, we extract knowledge from the document repository, knowledge in the form of RDF triples. And uh, NLM has built BKR, Biomedical Knowledge Repository. It uses UMLS and terminal resources, and it's an integrated Knowledge, large knowledge base. It, ha, it basically in the form of RDF tuples and ontologies. So we make use of the knowledge layer on top of the document layer to get the related documents. That's the basic idea here. And um, I won't go into much detail. So simply idea is we want to measure the document document similarity at the bottom. For that, we say we extracted triples from the documents. Now we have sets of triples for to represent document. Then we measure the similarity between the sets. How to measure the similarity between sets is like we have to have a mechanism to check the similarity between each predicate. So we measure the similarity between each predicate. How to do that is like we need to have a mechanism to have similarity between each concept. So when we solve the processing hierarchy, we get a similarity for document document. And then concept similarity, we follow a jacquard uh, based similarity. One interesting thing we did here is like in the biomedical ontology hierarchies, we also added the concepts itself to the hierarchy to preserve the semantics that's encapsulated in the levels of the hierarchy. In these two examples, the left-hand side, if we don't include the concept itself, both the values will be one. But we know the right-hand side should have more value because it is more down in the hierarchy, and it, is, uh, it should have more similarity between them. And then the first one, it is just upper in the hierarchy. So it could be more abstract. So in this way, we could measure the, the slight differences. And then using concept, concept similarity, we just use the average for the whole predicate, predicate similarity. An example here, it says um, some parts of the intestine of a rat and a horse. And then we measure the similarity between these two. And actually, if keyword-based or just concept-based similarities, it won't give this much relatedness. But using the ontologies and then the hierarchies that they have, in the BKR, we were able to get this similarity score, which could be further improved. And then uh, we solved the problem of uh, deciding predicate, predicate similarity. Now we have to 
have the similarity between two sets. For that, we just use an existing system. So the idea is measure the similarity in both directions and for a one direction, get the maximum match and then get the uh, average. So I'm not going to explain uh, the mathematical formulation, but that's the idea or what's happening there. Compute the similarity in both directions and then get the maximum at each instance and compute the average. Yeah. So probably along the line, one of the things that you considered there was like, uh, ISWC paper last time and WSPM paper this time, which uh, tries to create two semantic graphs and then calculate the similarity between the two. So probably that's, that might be something. So the, the, one of their baseline was the graph edit distance. Once you have two graphs, which is a set of triple, and then similarity is simply the graph edit distance, and they have built up one on it. So probably one thing you can use for the evaluation might be something like yeah, in this work, I also want to extend the evaluation, which is still at the preliminary evaluation. And that will be useful. Yes, and then, oh, yeah. Do you have labeled the data? How do you create? No, yeah, that's right. For the evaluation, uh, we just did a heuristic based evaluation. We, don't, we didn't have um, proper gold standard data set to evaluate. We use midline. But then we didn't have you, you, we didn't have labels. Like I give a set of results. Yeah, I label it, right? And then you can see, okay, this is really relevant for one, the other, not. Yeah, it is so at that you time. Have this data set, how can you say my approach improves over mm -hmm, yeah. others, right? So in the, here, the claim is not. I'm not saying it is better than the existing one. It's a different approach can complement the existing approach. But the evaluation now we have is no, not. You, you need to show something. Right? Yeah, yeah. You cannot say, I just do something different. Yeah, yeah. Now, Here, what's the meaning of doing that? Yeah, in this evaluation, right, what we evaluated against is like we retrieved related documents from PubMed. And then we just saw how good we are matching those, uh, no, retrieving that's those documents. The problem. So what what tool you use to retrieve the documents, and uh, maybe that tool that tool has n no perfect ranking. Yeah. You should say okay, and you cannot use that as a baseline. Mm. Say okay, I just match up. Uh, you you need something that I can improve. I can be better than. Mm. Right? So that's mm. your, your purpose, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, and. Um, for this, even at that time, even at NLM, the problem is in this domain, the bi uh, biomedical domain, it's hard to create the gold standard. But what I was thinking is like, can I do it on Wikipedia? Um, you, you, you may pay some money, like use, you know, crowd sourcing, hmm. <laughs> ask people to play with them. Uh, maybe the set is smaller, will be very helpful. Right. Yeah. Compared to without any labeled data, okay. So hmm. how can you argue your your method is better right? in what sense? Yeah. Right. Are you familiar with school work? Yeah. Yeah. But here, um, what we are saying is like um, at NLM, they were also interested in getting more fine-grained similarity measures because we consider the whole predicate, that means the triple. It no, captures the, the... Now you're talking about document ranking, right? Hmm. So you want to think about how to improve ranking, right? Hmm. So you say, okay, this is either I, I, I can improve the diversity of the result, the ranking result, something like that, right? So that's good. Or I can improve some metric that uh, all the people and the other people all accept, it, like ECG and ECG. Right? So that depends on the label the mm. data. Mm. So, yeah. so you should be clear about the, what the goal you want to achieve. I mean, there are mm. Also, there's yeah. so many efforts on ranking the documents. Uh, I, 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 think I, I, will, I, will, I will be looking for ranking, uh, summarizing the top key documents from a semantic search. Yeah, but then document summarization in like long standing uh, area, and then this is like 
getting the related documents. Like. I, but then how are you, I, I don't understand how you make a cohesive work out of it. I think the, we, we have some issue about putting the three pieces together. Yeah. I don't think we worked it out. Hmm. So this is just the preliminary evaluation. So against the midline search results. Um, we are using only triple base similarity. So we could see at least it agrees uh, on uh, to a, some extent using only knowledge based approach against a keyword based uh, retrieval approach. And then the, I will just present briefly the next part. So the alignment of knowledge scattered around data sets. So why it is important? So just an example, this, take, this screenshot is taken in 2013-14. So this service is not available now. But at that time, it was giving RDF uh, triples to, uh, to an entity being searched. So we could see it has same thing represented in like duplicates. One of the benefits of identifying relationships are similar is that we can present them in a cohesive or integrated fashion. So that's one of the uh, positive things that comes out of alignment and specifically property alignment. And then uh, existing work, some based on syntactic uh, approaches, some on schema, that means domain range and ontology classes they belong to. And then schema independent, that our approach falls under schema independent. We are not using any schema information. And the intuition is we are matching how many ex extensions match to decide whether the relationships or the properties are equivalent or not. In practical settings, um, it is hard to expect all the extensions matching or the complete matching of extensions uh, uh, for two properties. Um, what I mean extension matching is um, for example one, all the, the, the extensions match completely. Extensions mean the uh, subject and object for a, a property. For property P in first example, A and B, for Q, A and B uh, is the extension, uh, and the, all the extensions match. For example, two, two out of three match, but still, do you want to uh, continue, uh, decide whether it's um, match, matching or not? So, one example here I want to give is like place of death and um, place of birth. Extensions match, but then the intuition or intentions doesn't match. So we cannot simply take matching one extension is equivalent. So we have to get statistical evidence to see whether it matches or not. So we have match count and co count. I'm not going to go into details. So match count is like matching the appearances of matching both subject and object pair for each occurrence of the uh, property, two properties in two different data sets. Appearance count is like subjects match for the property, but objects, objects not matching or may not match. And then this is the approach that we do in step one. You start from the left-hand side, data set one, and you follow a co-reference link same as link to the data set two, and then then you ex extract all the triples, and then match extensions, and then decide whether properties are matching or not. This is an example. Um, if you are interested to look how it works, we can come back. We also implemented a parallel computation approach for this because it's so time consuming, because it has to match so many pairs. So we gained some significant amount of computation time uh, 
doing it in parallel. And this is the evaluation results for 500 instances taken from five data sets and then try to see alignment between the data sets uh, for the properties. I think we need to wrap up and I need to understand how are you, um, what exactly are you proposing to do next and um, oh. how everything fits together. These oh. are fundamental questions mm -hmm. we got to have at the end of this. Oh. Yeah. yeah, so this is the result. And um, first, um, uh, Ro explains the results that we achieved using extension matching. Second one is WordNet similarity for comparing the property labels to each other and then deciding whether they match or not. And then uh, the last two are string similarity measures. And findings that we find from our extension matching is it could identify simple string similarity matches using extension matching and synonymous and then complex uh, cases. And um, first note that um, similarity-based approaches couldn't identify occupation and profession. Um, WordNet had, had the limitations. And then conclusion, I have talked about basically three parts. First, how to do or present information or knowledge on the web in a concise and comprehensive way to the users. And by extending that approach, I also showed how we could enrich the knowledge graphs. And then, then I presented an approach of doing document similarity using extracted knowledge from regular web documents. And then lastly, in in seeing uh, knowledge across data sets, how we can aggregate or um, okay. uh, information. This is what you need to do. Uh, starting with your thesis statement, assuming you, that is even acceptable, uh, show exactly how the last two bullets fit into that. So I talked about uh, the work here fits in um, using knowledge on the web, semi, I, I, I put it as semi-structured information. Structured in RDF sense, semi-structured means literals also in there. So I presented in um, three ways of using this knowledge. How to present it to the users for quick and easy understanding, that is a summarization part. And then using the knowledge for existing techniques whether we could use the extracted knowledge, use case is document summarization, that is utilization part. And the third one is like, when you put knowledge on the web, it is scattered around, so alignment comes in. So in data integration. Go back to your thesis uh, uh, statement. First slide, second slide or whatever that is. All the way that's very slow process. You could go. Yeah. Now, now tell me how that fits in. So, I talked about summary summarization for quick and easy understanding. Right, but the point is, um, you know, look at the colored terms and. Uh, I'm trying to understand alignment in the context of summarization. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to me. At least I am not getting it yet. So my focus is not narrowed to the summarization approach only. It's about using this uh, knowledge on the web, like three then different you're ways. Then you write this statement differently. I mean, you use web can be summarized, that really is the most, uh, it, it, to, you know, that is the bi thing that bounds the whole uh, set of approach together. If it is not, um, um, and integrated through alignment, that appears to be put in the, in with the reference of summarization, 
at least as it is put, as I understand it. And if it does not, then we have a problem. Um, I'm not saying, so the summarized, utilize, and alignment, right? Three parts that I'm talking about, it's not. <coughs> well, then it's hardly integrated, you know, it's not a, if, if those are three yeah, separate I, things, then they I mean, are just we, not. Yeah, we definitely care. don't have a one use case that exercises all the three. That is, we do not summarize and then use the summary to cluster or hmm. compare. And if there are vocabulary mismatches, we are not bringing an alignment. I mean, we do not have hmm. one data set that does all the three yeah. as it stands. But that's, yeah. that, that is one problem. But even otherwise, I mean, you go to present separate work on alignment, there is massive amount of work on alignment. And then we'll get into a different rat hole about you know comparing with other work on alignment, for example. So, so unless unless you are utilizing in the context summarization, um, like you know, that's what I was trying to say. Suppose you were to take Schooner, um, uh, it gives you uh, top K, uh, you know, documents. It ranks it using the ontology like HPCO in that uh, case, and then you say, okay, now I'm going to summarize. Uh, you know, you, user can pick top ten documents, and I'm going to give you a summary. User can pick up five documents. I'm going to express a summary. Uh, you know, so um, and, and see whether my summaries are good, so that you get. Uh, and and summary would be uh, you know in property value pair kind of things or a graph kind of things. And um, then some users say, ah, of all these top ten documents, I'm interested in only this part, and I would re-rank the stuff uh, so that the user will get um, yeah, the summary is used to uh, quickly improve upon the ranking. Uh, and the user will get to the top one or two documents from the top ten very fast uh, because he's interested in that particular perspective uh, uh, you know of the domain uh, you know so search is for let's say disease name you got all these documents some will be about treatment and some will be about diagnosis and some will be about medication uh, you present summary obviously those properties will be you know clustered in uh, these three different contexts that I mentioned and then say, oh, I want to really uh, look at it in terms of uh, disease uh, diagnosis. And uh, you are re rank it to the best documents in diagnosis that comes up first. So it's just an example. I, you, if you come with a better idea, so be it. But um, right now, I mean, I, it needs to be tied. Uh, so far, all your core contributions and key papers that you want to talk about are tied to summary. If you don't tie it to summary, it doesn't belong to this thesis. The, you know, we, uh, you know, our students routinely publish 10, 15, 20 papers. Only three of them make it to the thesis dissertation. All the rest are there, but they don't have to be part of the thesis. And the same thing here. The fact that you're working on some paper doesn't mean that it's part of your thesis. Um, and there may be ways to do it, but that, that really needs to be thought. So. I'm not working on this area, but to me, it seems the, the key part is the semi-structured data <laughs> Maybe something like mining semi-structured well, semi data. semi-structured data extraction from uh, KK, the uh, extraction of semi-structured data from uh, text is right. usually is investigated right. very broadly. All right, the information right. right. I mean, more. if you talk about all this, you need to identify what you are, you need. I think summarization is the yeah. key. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't want to go into um, alignment. You don't want to go into uh, semi section uh, interaction. Right. That is uh, that is a that is a uh, part of a process. That is uh, something that you are routinely using in this work. Uh, but the end result is summarization. The research needs to be centered on summarization. Or you have to come up with a different thesis statement. Uh, so, mm. If uh, we put uh, better quality items of human consumption after using semantic web, then uh, the goal is uh, having better quality items of human consumption mm. with different uh, techniques that are not in the, that are not common. Mm. Summarization, alignment, and <laughs> That's a smart observation. Um, it will be very different, uh, you know. Um, uh, that is not not his two main papers. Variable thesis are not formulated that way. Um, 
what you say is a potential thing. You can, you know, you can rethink about it. Sure, I mean, uh, but uh, and we obviously are going to work hard to retain the importance of those two papers to your thesis. Um, but um, okay, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Now you have to think about it. Yeah. So I mean, so easiest fix is just say summary and forget the rest. But then means to do some other work. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, like, because it is certainly there's not a whole pipeline that you uses all this three, right? Lesson to everybody, right? It's <laughs> not just writing ten papers with uh, three. It's uh, finding the cohesive uh, subset that will make a strong thesis. It's, it's something you need to think about. Right. The papers are also valuable in terms of how you'll be pursued by the market uh, in terms of the amount of research and quality of research you can do. But that doesn't necessarily immediately directly tie to the thesis or dissertation. Right? So that's, that's a point. Uh, let me, I, I have some, we have some more things, but let us uh, hear from the, um, uh, from our experts on the committee, uh, you know, that are outside of this room. Uh, unless you want to say something. Do you want to say anything else before um. we go into discussion? I, um, the plan that I put, maybe I didn't. These are the three things that I thought I will be doing. Mm. Um, I want to combine the comprehensive approach for the entity summarization that the two parts that I discussed, and then adding more evaluations like uh, between data sets and also improvements in the summarization for a cohesive uh, representation of the entity summaries. Um, next is uh, do like focus on the evaluation of the document retrieval that we have a preliminary evaluation at the moment. And then the writing or completing the dissertation. So problem would be that uh, uh, it's unclear number two will fit into your dissertation. Uh, mm -hmm. And that needs to be rethought. We have several ideas. Um, the one that I just talked about right now in terms of summarizing the top end documents uh, that, uh, that is a result of semantic search uh, using the same semi structured data that you already have in your case. And then adding to that the summarization step may be one option. Other idea that comes to my mind is uh, you, you, you recall that um, um, just like uh, in analogies that uh, Sujan worked on text document and uh, you know um, then he uh, you know it for his entity extraction and then he is working on uh, doing it from Twitter data so different kind of data but the end you know the point here is that there is a core technology or core uh, you know innovation in regards to entity extraction from text but applied to two different uh, modality and uh, uh, and then you know it can still come together because you know end result is the same uh, on different kind of data. So yeah, I listed here, but not I didn't make it to the the three main goals. Like I have it here, like I wanted to try on a different domain. Yeah. So that is uh, it, that is that comes you know summarization of uh, um, Twitter search results. Suppose I take uh, Twitter and I get search results, just like your PubMed aspect. But then uh, I look, I get the results, and I somehow now, uh, you know, remember when you go to Twitter after a long time, uh, it gives you summary, right? So can you do better? Um, and in, in a little dif in a very different form. Uh, currently, they just pick the best uh, the top K results, but there's no summary of that. What did you miss, missed out in the uh, in terms of the concepts that were part of those tweets that were there? And then now we can pick the ones that you you are most interested in and just look at those. Mm -hmm. There are a thousand tweets while you were away. Uh, it talked about many things. One thing talked about um, uh, the problem, you know, tweets from your uh, colleagues that talked about problem in the industry. And now you have to pick, just focus in, there are a lot of other things, uh, tweets on politics and tweets on some, uh, you know, information sharing. But now you want to just pick out the tweets on, uh, you know, problems in your industry and, and, and re, you know, get uh, to those, that's another very interesting use case, which potentially could use, um, uh, it could, which you can use to really tie back to your dissertation. Okay, I, I'm going to stop here. I have some more things to say, but let us hear about, um, uh, you know, I don't want to I'll miss out on what our um, uh, committee members have to say.
Okay, um, who wants to start, Ed or uh, Gong or Ramit? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start, if that's okay. Just, uh, it's just a couple of quick questions. Um, the, the first one actually was actually tying back to the thesis statement. And I think when, when I look at part one and two, they, they fit quite nicely together. But the, the characteristics of the data set that you're using, the Wikipedia, I think, is shaping the, the, uh, the work as well. So, so the DBPD is a, it's an entity-centric graph data set, um, and I, I think that's maybe an interesting way for you to shape the thesis statement as, as just saying semi-structured data. There's lots of different types of semi-structured data. If you were specifically looking at a particular type of that, which is entity-centric graph data. Um, with that in mind, I, I would also uh, I challenge you to, to, to consider whether or not you want to align this with the semantic web or not. I, I think potentially what you have Known in part one and two is, is applicable beyond just the semantic web to lots of uh, other systems that are using uh, graph type data for, 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 for tracking entities. So I think your contributions could be broader than just sim web. Um, I, I just echo the points again that were made about the thesis statement needing to connect very closely to the evaluations and for it to be easy and obvious to see how your thesis statement is reflected in the evaluations and it's easy to see the measures and the contributions for that. Um, I, I have a number of other comments, but I think they're much more low level and I'm happy to, to send those on uh, via email and, and to discuss them further. Please. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you, you will uh, you know, like those uh, details comments too, of course. Yeah. All right, uh, uh, Kong? Um, I have one short question. Uh, it's actually about your last work on problem matching. And uh, your approach actually ba is based on uh, some known same as names between entities. But when we are given two or more data, data sets, we have we already have no links at, at the entity level and also have no links between properties. So how, how to use your approach in this scenario? That is how to do a, a cold start when there are no links between the Yeah, for that, um, we need to have links between the data sets. So it works on interlinked data sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the evaluation is between separate data sets, not within the same data set. Okay, anything else, Scott? Sure. Um, uh, there are, um, I have some number of questions that can be sent to you by email. Great, thanks. Amit? Sure, thank you, uh, Karl Pop, uh, for the presentation. Um, it, it was very, uh, you know, uh, helping a lot to understand the, the textual writing. Um, so I think um, piggybacking on the problem statement, um, I also agree with um, what Ed mentioned and uh, Ed partially also what um, you know, um, highlighted earlier by Amit that among the um, there is a need for a coherent story and that uh, is summarization. The document part is still doesn't link very well in terms of showing really the summarization. I think in a significant way to uh, to do the matching when. Um, and that's something that you may want to think about. Um, but still, I mean, the, leaving that in or out, if, if living in, uh, definitely um, uh, requires a little bit of more work uh, to, to type and as well as to work to show how that, uh, you know, the summarization would uh, benefit that problem. Um, leaving it out also, you have enough uh, great contribution from the um, you know, graph uh, summarization uh, point of view or uh, graphical representation point of view uh, if, if we don't want to call it so much semantic. Um, you know, that's just another aspect that you may want to think about it. But if you want to bring it to the semantic level, actually I would have liked to see some notion of um, abstractions to be included in the, in the discussion when you are doing summarization. So the, uh, the uh, typical metrics of conciseness as well as uh, you know, uniqueness or diversity 
of, of values. Uh, they are more applicable to, you know, if you go back to database standardization or, you know, some, there are a couple of uh, um, uh, references, that one of them I sent you on deep graph set based on uh, standardization. They go and um, basically benefit from those type of metrics. But when it comes to semantic web, that notion of semantic has to um, somehow be in there to, to basically um, to see how you have an answer. If you have an opportunity, I don't know how this timeline would work for you, you may want to take that uh, into account. And as um, Amit mentioned earlier, there are two notions of abstraction. One is to purely look at it, look at it, uh, looking at it from an ontology point of view, uh, whether you know, there are more um, higher level uh, concepts that are more inclusive, higher level in the ontology, or lower level, more concrete, if you will, if there is a way to distinguish that, um, or there is more this, this uh, texture description generation over some days. And there is another, actually, paper around entity centric summarization generating text summaries for graph uh, snippets. That's, uh, that's also something that I thought you may be interested in, and I'll send uh, your way as well. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Oh. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I have a question about the, the second second part. Document the ranking is really not a not a good uh, you know way to maybe. <laughs> yeah. huh. Ranking is uh, uh, very complicated, and you I don't think uh, you can really huh. do something that uh, you know significant uh, get significant results. In very short time. That's a, well, yeah, absolutely. It's a teaser topic by itself. You know, a teaser topic can be just uh, on that topic by, uh, on its own. Uh, but I leave it to, to your supervisors and advisors to make a judgment call depending on um, the situation. Okay, I think, uh, broadly speaking, I think there are two issues that came up uh, overall. One is that those three things will fit together and should we bear it down. The second thing is, can we make it personalized and is there a way to further uh, make the summary flexible, I guess. So those are two things that we may want to think about. Um, looking at the time, um, uh, as it is kind of two hours, uh, we have a couple of ways to do it. We either uh, spend some more time in the committee or if everybody is agreeable, uh, we work with Kalpa to come up with more um, uh, concrete action items uh, and, and, and perhaps some um, uh, you know, uh, clarity on the remaining work and uh, how the things fit together. Propose it to the whole, you know, all the members of the committee and uh, uh, then uh, uh, you know, see if the, everybody can sign off that uh, that is a better path, uh, that is the right path. Um, so rather than solve all the details here, uh, we just follow up and uh, it's shortly, it should not take more than uh, uh, two, three, four days uh, to send out either re revision of thesis statement, either uh, specific uh, uh, reordering uh, of the work or re-emphasizing some part of the work. And then, uh, uh, you, know, and, and, you know, of course it will have to factor in what Kalpa's own um, uh, interests are and uh, other constraints, and then we'll, we'll come back, uh, and, and you know, so then we document exactly what is planned, so that uh, there is not much mystery when he thinks he's ready to defend. Would that be okay for everyone? Yes, it works for me. Mm -hmm. Why for me is well not Okay, great. So uh, then uh, I want to thank uh, Ed uh, Gong and uh, Hamid uh, for joining us here, and. Uh, We'll get back very soon with um, uh, the um, action items and changes. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Hamid, Gong, and Ed. Thanks. See you. Bye. See you.